So, as your party approaches the casino, where you know the evil warlock Grodar sells his trafficked humans, he leans in and says, How about one quick game? Just to pass the time before the more exciting events this evening. Your wizard and your bard have agreed to the game. While the rogue and the ranger plan to use it as a distraction, while they try to find the prisoners locked within. As you sit at the table, you are dealt cards in a game of Three Dragon Ante. Alright, uh, what should we do? Yeah, I need the bard and the wizard to roll a d20 for me, please. Okay, I got a 15. Looks like the wizard... Oh, got a 7. Looks like Lord Grodar rolled a 17. Uh, so he takes the first hand and 10 pieces of gold from each of you. Wait. That's it? Yeah. What about my proficiency with my three dragon anti set? And can I roll to try to bluff? Uh, it's gambling. It's all luck. How are you supposed and to- And what about the wizard? Can't he roll insight to see if Lord Grodar has any good cards? Well, there aren't really any rules for the- Still, there really should be more to it than that. All right, all right, just give me a second to think of some rules. I would like to pickpocket the bard. Not now, rogue. Hello, one and all, and thank you for opening up your Dungeon Master's Handbook. My name is Russell, and on today's page, we're going to be talking about some of the mini games and gambling rules that I like to run in the games that I have over the years. I have some simple festival games like arm wrestling and archery, as well as some more complex card games like Three Dragon Ante. Let's be honest, who doesn't love a good minigame? They can be used to help the party get a good break from the constant adventuring and help them bond over a good game of cards. Or villains could use these games as a way to get information about the party, or the other way around. Also, they can be a good way for skilled members of the party to earn some gold. I've run minigames in my D&D sessions since the first campaign I ever DM'd. I refined the rules over the years, so I'm here today to give you five minigames that I like to use in my games. First up, arm wrestling. This is the simplest of the bunch. Most of it involves contested strength rolls between the player and an NPC. There are five stages, and the players start on stage three. If the player wins the strength roll, they move to stage four. If they lose it, they go down to stage two, and it goes on that way. If the player hits stage five, they win. If they hit stage one, they lose. One thing that I like to throw into the game is the ability for the competitor to mess with their opponent in some way. This is most commonly intimidating the opponent to dishearten them, or deceiving the opponent so they weaken up. The distractions in this table could come from a variety of skills. It could be a performance check, whistling a melody to distract them, or a sleight of hand check to change their grip for it to be more advantageous. The idea is the closer the opponent is to losing, the harder it will be for them to lose concentration. The Constitution DC can either be a skill check or a contested skill roll as well. The idea is that instead of trying to push the other hand back, they instead hold their ground and try to win through endurance. If they pass the DC, then they gain advantage on their next strength check. But if they lose, they get disadvantage. Generally, if the player passes the DC on the table, I will reward them with advantage on the next strength check. If they fail by five or more, however, then I give them disadvantage. For the intimidation, this failure could be the opponent flexing back even larger with muscles much larger than the players. Overall, very simple game, but it could become more complicated with player engagement. Number two, archery. The other incredibly easy game that is commonly found in festivals is archery. Now this can be reflavored to be any sort of accuracy game such as knife or axe throwing, but it's incredibly simple. They fire at a target, and depending on how well they hit the target, they get more points. And if they beat the daily high score, then they get a reward. With this game, the difficulty of winning is your decision. You can set the daily high score to be as high or as low as you want. I like the idea of having your name next to your score as well, and maybe there's been one person year after year at the top of the leaderboard until your party's ranger comes by and shows them up. It could make for an interesting new rival for the party. Number three, roulette. Moving into the gambling games, roulette is a classic in real life casinos, so it is one that is conceptually easy for the players to understand. The game is once again very simple, but the difficult part is the payout. In real life, the payouts for roulette are really, really confusing, so I made up my own. It revolves around a simple roll of a d20, and if you predict what the roll will be, you earn some money. 
This game is 100% luck based and there are three ways to bet. First, you can bet on the color, either black or red. If you guess correctly, you double your money. If not, you lose all your money. You have a 50% chance of winning, so the payout is the opposite, 200%. Second, you could bet on a single number. If you win that, you get back your bet times 20, since you have a 1 in 20 chance of winning. If not, you lose your money. Now the last option is the split. This means that you put your money between two numbers, literally. This means that on this table, you can bet on 1 in 5, 1 in 2, 2 in 6, 2 in 3, etc. Any two numbers that share a border. If you guess correctly here, then you get back your bet times 10, as you have a 10% chance of winning. Once again, if not, you lose your money. Now the more complicated rules. You notice there is a fee listed on all of these payouts. This is to ensure that casinos are still making a profit. The fee will vary from casino to casino. The more high-end the casino is, the higher the fee will be. A low-end casino would have a fee that's a matter of copper or silver, but a high-end casino could have a fee that's dozens of gold pieces. Now, to protect this from abuse, you should put a maximum bet on the table. I recommend this maximum being no more than 20 times the fee, perhaps closer to 15. So, for example, let's say we're at a high-end casino with a payout fee of 10 gold pieces. I put the maximum bet of 200 gold on that lucky number 7. It takes until the 8th spin of the wheel for it to land on the number 7. This means I have put in a total of 1600 gold pieces, and I won 4000. I take out the 10 gold fee to be left with 3990, giving me a net profit of 2390 gold pieces. I would say that getting it on the 8th spin is pretty lucky, so I think the math here works out fairly well. All in all, this game is a good way for your party to make money quick, or lose it all quickly. Number 4, Milcairn Hold'em. This game is based off of real life Texas Hold'em, renamed to fit into my world, now being named after a popular gambling destination. The game functions like ordinary Texas Hold'em. Each player stakes a standard amount, probably silver for a low-end casino or several gold for a high-end one. Then they roll 2d10s and keep them secret. They can then bet more money as they wish based on what they rolled. Then 3d10s are rolled for everyone to see. The numbers on these dice can be used by anyone. The players bet again if they wish. Anytime a bet is made, it must be matched by everyone else at the table or else they fold their hand and they are out until the next one. Then, one more d10 is rolled, betting happens once more, then a fifth and final d10, and bets go off for one last time. Players will try to make the best hand they can using the two dice they kept secret and any three of the dice in the middle. For this game, if a player has proficiency with a card set, they can re-roll one of the d10s in their hand at any time, but they must use the new roll. There are a few ways one could determine the end game of this card game. A full game of this would take quite a long time, so it's better that you instead say at the beginning that only five hands will be played, and whatever money you have at the end is what you walk away with. Or alternatively, those five hands could be representative of the entire game. So if you're up a little bit after five hands, you could be up a lot actually at the end of the game. The full game would consist of everybody starting with the same amount of gold, and the end is only when everyone but one is out of money. And number five. Three Dragon Ante, the most iconic game in Dungeons and Dragons. It's become a real tabletop card game that you can buy, but it also takes a while. This is also by far the most complicated game so far in this video. My rules to run it in game are as follows. At the start of the game, every player puts in an amount of gold. That amount is eight times the number of players, and there has to be at least four players. At the start of each hand, every player rolls a d20. Depending on what they roll here, they have a special card in their hand that they can play at any time. A player can only have one special card at a time. Each player then secretly rolls a d6, a d8, and a d10. They add the totals. If a player has proficiency with a 3 dragon anti set, they can re-roll any one of these three dice. They can choose whether or not to use the re-rolled number. The player with the highest total wins. Players with special cards can choose to use them after the results have been announced. These results affect how gold gets distributed. There are two possible endgames to this. First, you could say that you will play a fixed number of hands, 
Or, for a longer game, you play until somebody runs out of gold. This is another game that can be a climax for a social encounter. Also, these kinds of games can be used by important NPCs to determine whether or not they want to interact with the party. I just want to say at this point, players throughout any of these games are encouraged to use their skills in any way that they see fit that could give them an edge in the game. And for you dungeon masters, you can find ways that should they fail, it fires back on them, or if they succeed, grant them with some sort of benefit. So all in all, those are five simple mini games that I've run in my D&D games. I also love to know what you guys think. Leave a comment down below with any mini games that you've run for your TTRPGs. Also, comment with anything confusing about this video, because I'm sure I didn't make sense with everything that I said. I'd be happy to help you guys be able to run these minigames in your sessions. As always, thank you very much for watching, and I hope you find yourself at a table real soon.